to Pakistan's new soft power. I think it's going to be a very fascinating session because because it's a it's a it's a topic which uh, is um, quite open-ended, and I think we can uh, cover quite a bit of uh, distance um, trying to figure out what is the soft power that we have um, and how best to utilize it. So, so I have a, a lot of questions in my mind, and I think um, because we have um, a panel of experts which is uh, eminently uh, suited to speak on on this particular topic, I think we are going to have a, a very um, thought-provoking uh, session. So, without uh, um, further ado, let me introduce my uh, panelists for for today. Uh, our first panelist is Mr. Uh, Ishwar Hussain. Uh, he is uh, the head of the Institute of Business Administration, uh, one of the most eminent uh, economists of Pakistan. Uh, <laughs> second panelist is Begum Abda Hussain. Uh, she needs no introduction. One of the foremost political figures of Pakistan who's also um, uh, recently authored um, a very readable book uh, on the politics of Pakistan and, and some total of her experiences. And our last uh, panelist is Ms. Uh, Amina Sayyid, who is the Managing Director of Oxford University Press and who has uh, um, done tremendous amount of work to, to make these events possible. So thank you very much, all of you. Um, as we, as we um, go in, into this topic, uh, the first thing that comes to my mind is that this whole concept of soft power um, has been probably popularized by this gentleman called Joseph Nye, who, who works at the Harvard University and who originally wrote a book in the 1980s titled um, uh, The Soft Power. And he introduced this concept in international politics of how other the states um, can increase their influence by using the soft power that they have. And then over the years, he's honed this concept even more. Uh, and essentially, uh, if I were to define what he means by soft power, it is uh, all the means that a country has to be able to attract other people to its culture uh, and to its policies. Now, how, how does that happen? Um, both America and perhaps to a large extent India have practiced the art of, uh, of, of uh, soft power very effectively. What can we do? I think that's the primary question that I'm going to put uh, in front of my audience. So, uh, Dr. Ishan, if I were to start with you, would you agree with the definition of Joseph Nye, and, and does that apply to Pakistan? Thank you, Fahad. I think Joseph Nye has four major components of power structure. He starts with the military, political, economic, and then he comes to the soft power. And that is a very open-ended, all-encompassing kind of category. We all know that what the military, political, and economic <laughs> powers parameters are, and what the definition of these are. But soft power is something which is still to be defined in a very precise term. I would submit that the concept of soft power would vary from each country to another. I would go with Pakistan's assets, which can help in defining its soft power. It is the cultural and civilizational center of the Buddhist culture in Kandhara with Munjadado and Harappa civilizations. It is the pilgrimage center for the Sikhs of all over the world, not only India. It has the ecotourism potential, which is very much in demand by those who have been to Pakistan, to the northern areas. It has produced people like Rahat Fateh Ali, who along with Peter Gabriel have made Pakistan known all over the world. We have people like 
فواد خان علی ظفر راحت فتح علی این آتف اسلم ہو آر میکنگ ویوز ان انڈیا نیو ٹیلی ویژن چینل ان انڈیا وچ از زی زندگی ہیز اسٹارٹیڈ ٹیلی کاسٹنگ پاکستان ڈراماز اینڈ ایوری ٹائم آئی گو ٹو انڈیا ٹو اینی پارٹ پیپل آر گلوڈ فرام ایٹ ٹو الیون وی ہیو دی پوٹینشیل آف انڈیا پاکستان کرکٹ بینگ دا لارجسٹ crowd attractor not only within Pakistan and India but everywhere else these are the elements which can actually form the contours of what I consider the soft power I give the example of my own institution we have established strategic partnership with an Indian school of business with the SP Jain Institute in Bombay and the Institute of Management Technology in Ghaziabad and we have exchanged students and faculty and the students from India who come to us or faculty they become the best ambassadors of Pakistan because there are a lot of myths which are exploded when they come and interact their image was that all IBA girls would be in burqas and veils and they will not be mixing with the students and they will be segregated. That is the kind of hypothesis with which they begin. When they come and they say there's not much difference between our campus life and your campus life. And our students who go back to these institutions and come back become the best ambassadors of India. So this kind of exchange has created those feelings of understanding on the basis of which better relations can be forged between the two countries. And if you have a common history, common uh, political uh, platform which united us, a common infrastructure, uh, the whole South Asia region would be something which Pakistan can attract towards its shores and then the world will go, go around. So we ha don't have to be ambitious. We can start with our own region, which is South Asia, and attract people to come and visit and take part in many of these same things which we are engaged in. And the world will get around and this ha will have concentric circles. There will be more Asians coming in than the Europeans will come in. Of course, the security problem is a major issue. But we have brought in people And once they have come here, even the Americans, they are willing to come back. It is the first time resistance, mental resistance, which is really creating the barriers in Pakistan. But if you give them a whole package, which also includes the security arrangement and the coordination, I think uh, these kind of hurdles can be uh, eased and a beginning can be made. So, so, so tourism in many ways, we have, we have various uh, ways and means by which we can attract people and that could be one source of yes. soft power. Begum Abdasan, can you, what in your opinion are some other aspects of soft power that Pakistan can display? Well, as I see it, uh, soft power really stands for cultural expression in its various forms. Um, there is a whole spate of literature books that are coming out that are challenging and exciting. Uh, we have uh, a very strong tradition of music and um, our Sufi music is particularly appreciated. Uh, um, Dr. Isha just made mention of uh, Nusrat Fateh Ali and uh, there are other contemporary um, uh, kawals and uh, musicians and then our folkloric traditions are uh, extremely strong. Um, we also have uh, now a, a very vibrant um, tradition of um, um, art, uh, that is to say of paintings and sculpture and ceramics. Um, a lot of work is being done in these fields. Uh, much of this work is exhibited locally, but then there are some painters who are appreciated and have an audience overseas as well. Um, and then we have, of course, a magnificent tradition of uh, embroidery and stitchcraft, 
um, and uh, uh, we have in that comes our uh, the making of our handmade shoes, for instance, which are um, increasingly popular. Um, so uh, we have, uh, along with our various uh, the, uh, uh, traditions of working leather, we have uh, saddlery as uh, a skill, and saddlery is very much in demand um, from um, from here in uh, North America as well as in some countries of Europe. So. Um, whether we look at it from the point of view of projecting the way we are and what we do, what skills we have, whether it is with a view to increasing, increasing our exports, whether it is with a view to luring people to, uh, for purposes of tourism um, to our country, all of this is Unfortunately, very regrettably, since the last uh, um, at least decade, shadowed by this image of uh, terrorism and extremism, um, which stalks our land. So this is the downside, and this uh, is a deterrence to uh, many of our uh, gifted uh, people who can, who have a lot to offer. To, uh, to the world. Um, in this very hall, before our panel discussion, uh, there was a presentation by a young woman called Ambar Sami of jewelry. And she makes kundan in a very uh, novel way and um, has found uh, uh, not only a niche market in Pakistan, but also apparently her work has been deeply appreciated in India. Now, this is the sort of thing which uh, is there. It uh, will have a natural growth. I don't believe that with, the, uh, with anything aesthetic that you can force the pace of development. It, it has to be a natural process and it's on its way. But Mrs. Amina, so in, in this respect, then you know we, we've listed out many things. But are they really having an impact? If, if you were to look at it from a perspective of uh, a non-Pakistani, would he or she actually feel the impact of the soft power? Are we failing in projecting it? Um, I think we are, because I feel that we have an enormous uh, literary and cultural heritage. There, are, there is no shortage of um, artists of performing artists, of painters, of writers um, in Pakistan. And I think that um, the problem is that we are not projecting it. Uh, I mean, to give you an example, I went, uh, I was in uh, London in the last few times that I've been there. The Nehru Center over there is the most active cultural center in the UK. You go there, they will give you a calendar of events for the whole year with Indian artists, performers, writers, they have book launches. And I went to the Pakistan High Commissioner, I said, why don't you set up a Jinnah Center here in London? And in those days, actually, the house that Jinnah had lived in was up for sale. I said, please buy that house. Set it up as a cultural center. And I was told, no, it costs millions of pounds. So I said, what's millions of pounds for the government of Pakistan? We can afford it, please. But, you know, obviously, it wasn't bought. And as you know now, a uh, statue is being set up of uh, Gandhi in the Westminster uh, Square outside Parliament, where there, there are only two other statues, uh, Nelson Mandela and Churchill. And who's paying for this um, statue? The Indians. Not to, uh, and f funds are raised for it. It costs, it's cost again over a million pounds. And uh, they raise funds and they got it. Why can't we do that? Raise funds or at least get matching funds from the government and set up these uh, um, cultural centers. Because, I mean, we have the best artists, but where do they perform? Similarly, I think uh, I went to the Frankfurt Book Fair, and uh, there was uh, the theme that year was India. And there were about 50 or 60 Indian authors who were there. A whole hall was uh, reserved for Indian publishers. So I went to the organizers of the Frankfurt Book Fair, and I said, please make Pakistan a theme. Uh, f uh, just like you've done, because every year a different country is uh, used it. And they said, we are happy to do that, but the Indian government has paid for this. They have sent all the artists. 
And uh, the, uh, so, if the Pakistan government is prepared to uh, help us fund it, we will go ahead and do it. So I think it's really a question of projecting and of impact. Uh, j just a very quick example, I was told by the Turkish government that if you want to translate any of our Turkish writers into English or Urdu, we will pay for the translation and we will not charge any royalty. Why can't we do that for our brilliant writers? Why can't we have their books, pay for translation of their books? Dr. Shidhan, whose responsibility is it? I mean, we all know that we have certain um, avenues for projecting our soft power. It's a, this whole, this, this literature festival in itself is, is part of the soft image that we can project. Is it again the government, like everything else, it is the responsibility of the government and it is failing? I don't think we have to completely abandon our own responsibility as citizens of Pakistan. And we established the National Academy of Performing Arts. I remained chairman of that board for six years. And we established private-public partnership, where the government of Pakistan is providing an annual grant to support the center. But we were raising money from the other corporate houses, from the donors, from individuals. Then, because of that, we were able to finish our theater, which was under construction. And every evening, we are having some performances or other and collecting revenues from there. So there are ways in which you can have this public-private partnership in which both these sectors do. If we have this dependence syndrome on the government, this is very erratic. One government may come in and may patronize the literary festivals or the performing arts or art galleries, and the second government comes in and just puts in a stop. So for the continuity and consistency, we have to have a different model whereby everyone of us who is really enlightened and who believes, like what Amina and, uh, and Abdul Hussain said, in the cultural heritage of Pakistan to showcase it. And I think that's the only way we can do it. But I don't believe that we should just abandon our own responsibilities and rely only on the government. So in, the, in that respect then, uh, Begum Abdul, if, we, if, we, if I take this concept a little forward and inject it into the art of statecraft, when, when we're talking about soft power, uh, power in itself means that you, you're influencing somebody else. Um, and if you take the example of the Americans or the Indians or the Europeans, through their soft power, they influence other nations. They, they try and get their own way through attracting them. These all these elements that we're talking about, are they enough, if, if utilized properly, to influence world public opinion in favor of Pakistan? Yes, indeed, I, I do believe it's enough. I think that... Um, um, what we have to, off, uh, have to offer is diverse and uh, uh, interesting in, in many ways. So it is enough to offer. It's a question of uh, generating the interest. And here, when you talk about responsibility, it is indeed the leading responsibility is that of government. But then our institutions, including, including our education institutions also, have a role to play and um, a very vibrant civil society with its many different uh, associations and organizations. Um, one of the areas in which I think we have uh, quite a lot to offer is food. Now, um, for instance, uh, chapli kebab is uh, something which um, is exciting. It, uh, it's uh, exciting to the palate. And um, there are not enough outlets um, for a country where, uh, for instance, McDonald's is a roaring business. Um, our own foods, although we have a, a culture of restaurants now emerging, but we don't have enough, enough of it in other parts of the world. Um, in, um, uh, when I was for a short while um, living in Washington, um, the Afghan the cut place was a very, very popular location. And uh, I would keep trying to persuade Pakistanis to um, set up uh, restaurants, to consider this as a line of enterprise, etc. Uh, but there was uh, not much uh, happening there. 
There may be a little more in the last uh, that might have emerged in the la last two days, but not nearly enough. And then we have a very important area in which we have a lot to offer, and that is our animals. We have a wonderful <coughs> equine tradition. Tent pegging, for instance, is an extremely exciting sport. We failed to get tent pegging included, for instance, in the Olympics. Uh, we failed to popularize tent pegging. Was there an uh, effort made? Sorry? Was there an effort made to do that? Um, I think some weak effort was made by, um, uh, um, at some point, but not good enough. We have this um, wonderful equestrian tradition of uh, um, all sorts of um, skills with horses, dancing horses and so on. Um, and then we have uh, a wide range of um, um, different breeds of bovines, of cattle, um, uh, from very big, strong oxen to uh, dairy cattle, our own indigenous breeds. The Sahiwal, uh, for instance, is very competitive with uh, many of the better breeds in um, all parts of the world. Um, I visited a ranch in California about four years ago which stocked a uh, hundred thousand head of cattle. And um, when I asked them um, whether they had heard about the Sahiwal, they said, uh, that's Zebu cattle. We're very interested. Now where do we get it? So um, we spoke in our embassy. We suggested to our um, uh, trade commissioner there that he should get in touch with uh, um, uh, this uh, Harris Ranch and um, at this end I said that I would be happy to share data etc. But nothing really came of it. There is um, invariably some amount of laxity in um, what we ought to do. Uh, another very popular thing is, uh, it's quite unique to Pakistan, is truck art. Um, but there again, we have failed to mount a full exhibition of truck art. And uh, most importantly, where uh, Dr. Ishat Hussain started his conversation, Gandhara. You see, for the Japanese Buddhists particularly, the Gandhara civilization and uh, its um, uh, various manifestations in Pakistan hold tremendous interest. But then again, we have not been able to develop and um, uh, grow on that. I recall um, about uh, 20 years ago or so, uh, there was an ambassador of Japan to whom um, I suggested that uh, he play a role in encouraging young Japanese to come for adventure tourism to Pakistan. Um, so he asked me to write, uh, uh, write up a paper, and I did. And rafting down the Indus caught the imagination of some young Japanese um, who came out, and they were picked up by dacoits um, somewhere in Sindh. Um, they were recovered, and uh, uh, the dacoits wanted money, which uh, some of us got together and managed to, uh, to pay, so the Japanese did not have to. But it was a setback. <coughs> so we have these, uh, uh, you know, we lurch from uh, one uh, uh, pleasant, unpleasant episode to another. Nonetheless, nonetheless, the um, uh, projection of soft power is very, very, um, I think, important for improving Pakistan's image and for attracting uh, people from all over the world to visit us. Let me play the devil's advocate, Mrs. Uh, Sayyid. Uh, all these are well and good, but when we are talking about soft power globally, it's very difficult to imagine that these things will be able to compete with the popular culture which is coming our way, whether it's coming from uh, North America or Europe or, or their movies or their music or even in, in, in our region. I mean, those are, th that is the kind of soft power that, which is influencing millions and millions across the world. Are we competing on the same wicket? Uh, all these things that we're talking about, do they even stand a chance in front of the soft power that is surrounding us from all over? You know, I think we do. Uh, but we have to work at it. We have to invest in it. 
uh, I'll give you a couple of examples. For example, um, Qadali. Now, Qadali is very popular. But my only um, question is, or my, the problems that I have with, with Qadali is that it, there is no gender balance in it. I haven't come across women Qadals. And I think it's very important that we promote this kind of, the, you know, woman power as well. Now, um, I know that uh, some of our Qadals had gone to the UK and, um, you know, they have a huge potential. I mean, Nusrat Fateh Ali Khan was a celebrity, a rock star. Now, uh, Channel 4 wanted to have a session of Qadali. So they met these Qadals and, uh, you know, they refused to have, uh, to record them. They said, what are they eating? What is that red dribble coming out of their mouth and why do they keep spitting? They said, we can't show that on television. So we have to actually train and work on, on this so that we present at least, a, you know, a civilized image. Uh, I'm sorry to have to mention this, but, you know, we have to um, groom uh, these people but then who are going to... Um, is, is it, is, does the private sector need to come into this? Because absolutely. I think we put in too much uh, focus on the government and we know how incompetent it is. No, no, absolutely, and I agree, agree with uh, Dr. Ishat Hussain, the private sector has to. I mean, um, Coke, Coke Studio is doing a brilliant job. They're discovering new uh, singers and artists and projecting them. I think the literature festivals that are being held in Karachi, Lahore, Islamabad, now there's one in Faisalabad. I hope this becomes a movement. India has 67 literature festivals per year. We have four, I think, I hope that every city and town in Pakistan will have it. And the Independent covered this. They said that uh, Karachi's answer to bombs is books. Uh, so I think, and our authors are stars, you know, people like Kamra Shamsi, Mohsen Hamid, Mohammed Hanif, these are now internationally recognized people. You go to any bookshop in the West, you will find their books. So we have to go a long way to project these people. I think Abda Hussain's book, Power of Failure, is going to project a very positive image of Pakistan around the world. It has been exported to the UK, to the US, and uh, it will uh, show readers over there women's empowerment in Pakistan. So, Dr. Sir, fantastic books coming out um, in, in English, in Urdu, of course, in English, which is being read by international audience, where uh, our music is uh, crossing borders, uh, musicians doing wonderfully well in other countries, other markets. Uh, we produce some brilliant films which have done well commercially and critically also. So, the elements are there. What's the missing part? I think that's just like anything in Pakistan, it is the coordination failures. That's the our problem. We all work in silos and compartments. We don't talk to each other. I illustrate you with a simple example of Jaipur. Jaipur is one of the most attractive places where cultural shows are held and tourists go. And this is all, you know, integrated. That hotels are private, but they are connected with the Tourist Development Corporation of Jaipur, which gives them a calendar of events which they are organizing. Then the private performers give their calendar to the hotels. The taxi drivers are paid by these performers in order to bring the guests from these hotels. So both the government, the private hotels, the taxi drivers, the performers, they are all working in a coordinated and concerted manner. And that is what really matters. There are information failures. We have hotels in Karachi. And I asked mm -hmm. the general manager of Sheraton, do you know that we have these plays taking place at Napa Theater? And he says, oh, I didn't know about this. So we have to work together outside these silos, work in a coordinated manner, and stop this blame game, which has become so favorite in Pakistan, that we just shift the blame to others. Let us accept our responsibility in the sphere which we are operating and try to work with others together. And I tell you, this is what's going to happen. This is not a priority for the government, is it? Is any government, bureaucracy, the way that our governing system works, you know, you know that very well. Are they capable of actually digesting this 
uh, this knowledge, this information and actually translating it into action? Do they have it in them to be able to do this? Well, they're paid for it. We have a, uh, we're one of the, <laughs> one of the few governments in the world actually that have a whole ministry for culture and heritage. And um, it's uh, well staffed. Um, let me give you an example. Um, you know, we have uh, in, we had in the Lahore fort a sound and light Soil Lumiere um, um, uh, demonstration, very popular, very popular. Um, in the 70s, uh, uh, we organized a fashion show of clothes that were made by in, in um, work centers by rural women, and uh, which were based on our traditional um, uh, stitch craft and so on. Um, we had this very elegant event with the so with the soil lumiere complementing it. Then, when more and more recent times, at, uh, uh, the Prime Minister of India, Atal Bihari Vajpayee, came, there was a dinner hosted by Prime Minister Sharif for him in the Lahore fort, and um, the the location was absolutely spectacular and so on. But all of that has fallen into disuse. On the other hand, we have the Food Street in the um, you know near the Walled City, which is a new uh, new thing, new phenomena, very attractive, and shows uh, Lahore off really uh, at its best to get stunning views of the Badshahi Mosque and so on. Regrettably, the um, this bus, uh, uh, what's it called, the new the, bus jung the Jungla bus of the city, <laughs> Jungla bus. The metro uh, obscures some of the view of the fort and the mosque, which is regrettable. But nonetheless, the, uh, that is there. Now, um, we also have some uh, an organization called the Export Promo Promotion Bureau. This is an old organization. It's very heavily staffed. And um, uh, they're supposed to take Pakistani products to all um, industrial fairs and exhibitions all over the world, and they do indeed. Um, but then the emphasis is always on the part of um, um, uh, our officials on what they're going to buy to take back to the wife at home and for the kids rather than, you know, for the money, uh, stuff. But uh, there again, um, um, it's, it has to be, uh, the initiatives have to be taken by uh, private enterprise, by those who have indeed something to sell. Um, and if we go into the whole sort of vast area of tourism, we've had a Pakistan Tourist Development Corporation, which has been around also for a long time. Um, but as Dr. Shut was saying that, you know, your average uh, four-star, five-star hotel have really no awareness of the cultural events going on in the city that the hotel is located in. Um, so there is a, a lack of flow of information and this, uh, this needs to be examined. I think the hotel associations, for instance, um, need to work harder. On the positive side, you have the story of Felites, which has been wonderfully renovated and um, is indeed, uh, it's a tribute to all the people, particularly Nayyar Ali Dada, who contributed to that. So we have the positive going on. Um, we need to coordinate better, obviously, um, and we need to put uh, our hearts into the whole effort and make it uh, into a voluntary um, upsurge of uh, um, uh, a collective effort to do things for our country. Let me try and bring the discussion to, uh, to uh, um, a conclusion shortly because then we, I think we'll open the floor for some questions. But I think I want to uh, uh, have the three panelists talk about something which Dr. Ishit Hassan wrote a couple of years ago and I remember reading, reading that. He wrote a column called Brand Pakistan and how you can treat this uh, you can um, treat this country as a brand and sell it abroad like you sell brand it was a eye opening column and i was talking to him earlier today also the whole concept of branding pakistan 
for the world. Now, before I come to him, uh, let me just, um, you know, sort of open this question to Mr. Zamina Sayyid. Uh, branding Pakistan uh, means that we are expanding the, the definition of our soft power and trying to see what are those things that we can, which the world could be interested in, which the world, world could think positively of. And this is not a new concept. For the last couple of years, governments have been trying to project the soft image of Pakistan. On the whole, are we on the net positive? Like, have we gained, are we better off in terms of defining our soft image than we were, say, a decade ago? At least, are we moving in the right direction? Well, I think, uh, yes, I would say so, because I think the way that uh, our authors, our performing artists, our, uh, our artists themselves, the way that they are being projected, um, throughout the world, again by, uh, you know, mainly by private interests. I think they, they have made an impact. Uh, now what's getting in our way is actually security. Uh, for example, I think Mohenjo-daro would attract thousands of people. I know that, uh, but um, you know, people can't go there because of security and because uh, there are no um, tours or package tours. Even the flights are not convenient. You can't make a day trip. So I think that we have, um, museums, our museums need to be properly filled up. Um, they're not fully equipped. But uh, I think that, you know, the p potential, I would say, is enormous. And things are getting better, and um, partly because of the achievements of our artists across the board. And I do feel that these literature festivals have also done their bit. Uh, as you can see here and in the Karachi festival, there were a lot of visitors who have come from all over the world. And I think this kind of interchange of ideas and the debates that have been held, I think that's the best way to promote our image when people get an understanding or uh, an insight into uh, how people think and how they feel over here. So things are getting better despite the government? Well, uh, I think despite security, despite. I would say. That despite the the security situation. No, I'm not uh, actually, uh, I'm not here to criticize the government. I think the government has an important role to play. And here, I mean, this, uh, the Arts Council has been given by the Punjab government. The Punjab government has uh, set up the Faisalabad Literature Festival. So I think uh, they are doing their bit, but uh, all of us together, the corporate sector has to play uh, its role, uh, and the government, and of course, efforts. I think together we have uh, a great country to promote. And when we're talking about promoting the country, Dr. Ishida Sen, that's where we come into branding the country, as you said. Brand Pakistan. Explain to us, what do you mean when you say brand Pakistan? Yeah. For example, if you think of word association, if you think of Argentina, what do you think? Beef. That this is the best beef in the world. If you talk about Switzerland, you talk about chocolate or mountains. That word association with Pakistan, unfortunately today, is terrorism. And that is what we have to completely change. Because the word association with Pakistan is FPAC, and FPAC is all terror, extremism, fundamentalism. What can we do in order to work against this particular access baggage we have. And that is where we have to change the image of Pakistan, the brand of Pakistan. It won't happen overnight, let's not pretend. But we are a very resilient country, and I have great faith. Amna Sayyid single-handedly has been doing this Karachi Literary Festival. The people of Karachi, despite all you hear about Karachi, come in throngs and attend these festivals. Look at this Lahore Literary Festival. We have food festival in Karachi, the Freer Hall, which is a heritage piece, and there were thousands of families which were able to come in. So the brand Pakistan is that you bring in outsiders to focus on music, art. I mean, look at Rashid Rana has created headlines in Europe because he has done a marvelous piece of collage. Imran Qureshi has won the Deutsche Bank Prize, which is a prestigious prize. Let us hope that some of our uh, you know, authors win Booker Man Prize. 
these are the kind of things which will change the image of Pakistan, the brand of Pakistan. Dr. Abbas, and final closing words before we go to Q&A about uh, the soft power and, and, you know, the final thoughts. Pakistan has uh, uh, a very gifted, very talented um, public and uh, a lot to offer the world um, by way of um, philosophical articulation, by way of uh, uh, poetry, uh, the Sufi strand of our uh, uh, faith and ex expression. Um, the visual arts, the performing arts, uh, we have a very great deal to offer and um, I do believe that uh, uh, Pakistan has a great future. Sometimes I'm questioned about it and I say that you know, there's a, there is a demographic shift. It's a very young nation and um, a vibrant nation. So. Uh, the moment this uh, terrorism story settles down is behind us, we're going to be a big box office draw for the entire world. I, I do believe that people will come here in very large numbers to see us and to observe uh, our culture and our heritage. So I look ahead with optimism. I hope it happens in my lifetime. Did you mean a few words? Well, I think, again, uh, um, I feel that we have to hold on to our space. I know that uh, space for cultural activities has been shrinking in Pakistan, but um, uh, let's not um, uh, wait, let's start uh, immediately. I mean, let's reclaim this space, and we can only do it through holding a lot of cultural activities, uh, whatever kind that we do, performances, readings, theater, dance, let's, uh, let's have these all over Pakistan. And also, if people are afraid to come here, let's um, uh, send our um, cultural amb ambassadors all over the world. Thank you very much, uh, all three panelists, for a wonderful discussion. Uh, I'll just take one minute. I want to give you an anecdote. I was in Paris for international conference, and the Embassy of Pakistan organized a mango festival bringing in mangoes from Pakistan's different parts. And there were many French men and women. So I said to them, is this the first time you have come to the embassy? And one of the gentlemen said, yes, I have. I said, why haven't you come before? Oh, the embassy organizes these seminars on Kashmir. We're not interested in it. You bring in the best cultural troupe. You bring in the best artists, the best painters, the best musicians from Pakistan, and you will see that we will come in throngs here. That is what my story is, that let us get out of the hard image of Pakistan to the soft image of Pakistan, and that is the purpose for this. Thank you very much. Uh, we have 15 minutes for Q&A, so uh, if I could uh, ask you to raise your hand and please keep your questions brief so that more people can actually ask them. Yes, ma'am. I just, uh, this is very interesting and I know that in the last governments uh, there was a lot of money that has been spent on uh, the soft image of Pakistan. So this is something that has been going on, ongoing on for a long time and nothing has been done about. My uh, observation is that why is it that we do not spread this word around, why is it that, and, and as, as Dr. Ishapuran said, that there are, there's so much happening, the festivals, and yet, uh, th there is no connection, they are working in different, in little pockets. So what I was saying was that um, a media, that should be playing a major role in promoting uh, our arts and culture all over the world, in Pakistan, so the role of the media, the newspapers, they should be really, really doing a lot more than they are doing at this time. You ask any journalist to come and cover any exhibitions or anything, we have to beg them, and, and I think that that is a really sad situation. With so really, with due apology to Fahad because he belongs to the media, <laughs> if a country has its prime time 8 to 11 dominated by talk shows where only the politicians are beginning to fight with each other, forget about having a soft image of Pakistan. We, we, we've just had a very interesting one-hour session on the media, so <laughs> I think I'll let this one go. Uh, um. 
Uh, hello, sir. Thank you for conducting such a beautiful session. It was uh, really nice uh, listening to you. Uh, I'm from Karachi and I uh, own a startup. Uh, how do you think like entrepreneurs, Pakistani entrepreneurs, could do their bit in uh, promoting the stock image of Pakistan? Because there is no such uh, that much patronage uh, to the entrepreneurship and startup scene in Pakistan. So do you think uh, we could make a scene out of it? And if we does, uh, from there do we sh should we find the patronage? Okay. Who wants to take that? I will take that. The tragedy of this country is that we all rely upon patronage. Entrepreneurship and patronage are two different concepts. Entrepreneurs have idea and people with money will chase them for that idea. One of my students just sold the first startup only after one year to one of the other companies for a certain large sum of money. And they retained him as a chief executive to run this. So please do not think. The tragedy here is that every businessman wants some patronage of the government, some SRO in order to survive. You cannot do that. Entrepreneurship and patronage don't go together. Ji, Zen. Uh, OK, please, ma'am, you go ahead then. Um, I don't know how to actually put it forward uh, as a question or as a concern. Um, I feel, I mean, we've been talking about the soft uh, side of the Pakistan and all, but I'm um, talking about the security in terms of that. But I feel there is a set of people with religious set of mind, and they very normally uh, you know, appreciate all this uh, dance, the singing, and all that stuff. And the, perhaps that is the reason we are not been able to have dance schools and singing schools in Pakistan because, you know, there is a lot Climate AI out there and people do not appreciate that. Uh, do you think that government do not support us in those areas because of the fact that we do not have religious out there and do not appreciate that? I mean, why not do that up to pay with government not supporting us? I think if I were to put another way, is soft power being crushed under hard attitudes? Um, <clears throat> if hard attitudes are because of religion, and I think that the uh, questioner is making that suggestion more or less. Am I right? That um, our, our religion somehow um, is in the way of Pakistan's uh, cultural projection. Um, I don't think that, uh, uh, that there is uh, you know, nothing in that question. I mean, that, that is a valid observation. Um, I do think that uh, uh, the way we interpret religion, um, we, we kind of, it becomes an impediment uh, for cultural expression. But then, you know, we're also the culture of poverty, and the culture of poverty has many dimensions. I have a, an anecdote which you may not be, you may not find it directly relevant, but it, um, will um, highlight the reality that, uh, that there is a culture of poverty. Um, uh, in, uh, we had a very bad flood here in 1992, and my district, which is Jhang, was very severely hit. I happened to be in Washington, and um, I managed to arrange a concert for Nusrat Fateh Ali uh, at the Kennedy Center. Now, Nusrat had performed in Washington many times, but he would be performing in school halls and that sort of thing. This is the first time that we were going to do something at the Kennedy Center, and we had uh, all the major corporations that um, uh, are present in, uh, that have a presence in Pakistan uh, donating towards this concert, and we also had um, many senators and congressmen who came to attend it. Um, we had a professional to um, arrange the event, and just before the curtains went up, he came to me and said, um, uh, Nusrat Fateh is calling you. So I went uh, just behind the stage, and he was sitting there, and he said, Ke kawali nahi ho sakdi. So I said, Ki matlab hai? So he said, Mera tabalji naat hai. Tabalji naat hai, kawali nahi ho sakdi. So I asked my deputy chief of mission, Sarvar Nakfi, to immediately get in touch with all the taxi drivers, since uh, there was a large presence of Pakistanis among the taxi drivers in Washington, and they had ferried large numbers of people to the, to the event. 
I said, please call the, um, or the taxi services and tell them that whoever has left the Kennedy um, Center should be brought back. So we recovered the Qawa and uh, we averted disaster somehow. There is this great desire for, uh, 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 among the Pakistani people to export themselves to different countries in search of a better living. And if somehow we could project that people take themselves and their, what they produce or what, what other people produce that they, that they have collected to, um, to uh, start up businesses um, based on our, um, our products, then we would be doing generally very much better. And religion would not be a concern. Religion would not be in the way. So uh, we have to try, as Pakistanis also emphasize, that religion serves very often as a substitute for the hardship and the poverty that a large number of people live in. Um, you want to add something? Yes, actually, I just want to say that, you know, there are a lot of myths that are circulating. And one of these myths, for example, is that, um, you know, what you're saying about religion get, getting in the way. That has not been my experience. Another myth is, I mean, there, there are so many performances, there are dance performances, there are theater, and you go there and they are packed. Uh, and another myth is that um, Pakistanis don't read, or the reading habit is declining. It is not. I mean, at the Karachi Literature Festival, 125,000 people came in three days. So, I mean, what does that tell you? I think really these are myths. I think if opportunities are provided, people are going to throng to them. Okay, we have five minutes left, so very quickly we have one question from, I think we had one from here. Who has the mic? Um, G, please. And one from here, the last one. Uh, my name is Dorsan Patak. Um, I wanted to ask the panelists about art creation. The antiquity is the artifact that lies in the um, museums, the galleries, the archives in the Western countries. Uh, shouldn't they be moved back to Pakistan? I mean, countries like Greece and Egypt, they're heavily lobbying in the Western countries to get their pieces back in their country. What about Pakistan? <laughs> Just a brief answer. If, uh, who wants to take it? Getting, getting our artifact, artifacts back. Yeah. Oh. That had been stolen out of Pakistan. That had been stolen or moved uh, by the British before partition to their museum, like the British Museum of the Met in the New York City. Even Pakistanis have taken them out. Well, not Pakistanis, mostly they've been taken by British. Well, uh, yes, certainly uh, a lot of... The UNESCO Convention, I'm sorry, I'm interrupting you. And the UNESCO Convention, they're bound. Yes, certainly. There, there's a lot of, um, many museums um, in different localities, but principally the British, have uh, um, objects and um, heritage that, that belong to us. And uh, we have to, uh, we should be making a very concerted effort to, to get all of that back. But concurrently, we have to make a very serious effort to prevent things from leaking out of the country which happens regrettably all the time. I'm aware, for instance, of an ambassador who uh, went to the Taxila Museum, used a rank, uh, a diplomatic rank, got a perfect bodhisattva removed from there, took it to the United States, and it en ended up being auctioned by Sotheby's. So um, this is the sort of scandalous thing that we have to, prote uh, to prevent contemporaneously and also let us not forget that with our excavation particularly with Gandhara uh, we had a team of Italian um, archaeologists who came and worked there who took uh, um, uh, truckfuls of uh, relics and uh, were not uh, what not prevented in any way and we have to try and struggle to get all of that stuff back as well. Okay, last question. Right, so uh, the impression that I get is that, of course, you all agree that uh, in terms of cultural things we have to offer to the world uh, to showcase and portray our software, there, there are lots of them. Uh, uh, but the impression I get is that it's mainly an image problem and we're not able to project them. Uh, but if you, uh, I mean, sure, 125,000 people will come to Karachi Fest, 
But if you look at the number of people in Pakistan, number of books which are sold in Pakistan, if you, if you talk to news producers, they'll say that the number of cultural events and music gatherings happen, happen in any week is maybe a handful. So uh, the, the terror, so the, th the security thing we talked about, uh, it, it, it's not really uh, an image problem. You know, we, I mean, there are uh, structural constraints which limit this showcase of uh, cultural power, soft power, which we want to. I mean, there are larger forces at work. I mean, uh, the community that uh, blame the media, the government for not playing its role. Uh, but you, you, your comments on what I just said. Do you think the security issue which you is said, is it a real problem or is, it just, is, the, is the problem deeper than the one that we've talked about? See, you have to separate out the transitional problems from the structural problems. What we are talking about are the structural problems of Pakistan that from its inception, even in, before its inception, this is the cradle of the civilization of the Buddhists. The Koreans and the Japanese die to come to visit Kandhara. That is not something to do with the security, yes. From 2001 to 2015, we are in this transitional problem that we have a security problem. But suppose this is eased out. Are we working together in order to overcome those structural problems and difficulties and put Pakistan on the map? That is what we are talking about. We don't deny the intensity of the security problems, but this is a transitory or transitional problem. It is not embedded in Pakistan's DNA. I think that uh, brings us to the close of this discussion. I'd like to thank Dr. Shita Sayan, Begum Abda Sayan, Mr. Mina Sayyid for uh, a very intellectual discussion. Thank you all for attending.